we are kings and our words matter. You get to the wealthy place and you live that wealthy life. You live in the blessings of God. When you delight in the word of the Lord day and night, you become that person that lives in that wealthy place. I love you, Lord. And I God is so big that we, are, we fail to stop and think about it. And we go through the religious exercise of just begging and pleading and all of these things. That is why prayer has become a tedious exercise. That is why prayer meeting is often attended by very few people because it's a religious exercise it's become. That's why very few people spend any time, length of time in prayer because it's just become a boring religious exercise. But when you realize... What Jesus said when he said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Prayer is not my idea. I didn't invite prayer, invent prayer. No preacher invented prayer. No religion invented prayer. God of heaven who made everything, he says, you ask. You seek and you knock. And then he says, for everyone that asks, it shall be given unto him. Everyone that seeks shall find. Everyone that knocks, for him it will be opened unto him. He says, hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, but ask in my name. And whatever you ask my father in my name, my father will give it unto you. 
In John, John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it shall be done unto you. And it literally means, one great Bible scholar says, it literally means, ask whatever you will, and if it's not available in this whole earth, it will be made for you and delivered to you. <laughs> Don't just ask based on what is there. Ask based on what God can do. He's the creator. He will make it for you and give it for you. That's the way the Bible says. But the thing is, we never meditate on these things. We're ready to pray. Oh God, you know. Immediately we just go into the begging posture, you see. That's wrong. We must meditate until we get to know this heavenly father, this wonderful father whose love has provided far beyond anything mind could ever comprehend. We must first get to know it and out of that revelation our prayer must arise and then our prayers will be God-honoring prayers because we'll be asking big, we'll be asking on God's level. That is what God wants for us. Amen? Are you there? See, the problem is, you know, when I was growing up, nobody preached about how there is a wealthy place. When we came to these verses, it's like this express bus, you know. This bus doesn't stop here. <laughs> we, just, we just read it so fast, you know. These are places we never stopped. We read, we went through water and we went through fire, but you brought us to a wealthy place. Keep going, keep going. Don't stop, you know. We don't stop and meditate on those things. And when we got to preaching, we picked the most difficult verses. The Lord shall break your neck. <laughs> you dis disobedient and perverse generation. <laughs> Some, something like that. We'll always find some verse like that. All the good verses are only in the calendars. <laughs> All the other verses we preach about every Sunday. <laughs> I don't know how we pick the verse. I, one fellow was telling me, uh, Pastor, tell me you're preaching every Sunday, three, I mean, every week, three, three, three times. Uh, how do you find out what to preach? What do you preach? I said, very easy, man. You know, if you don't know what to preach, just go to any calendar. <laughs> Christian calendar. <laughs> Whatever day it is, Sunday, just look at that verse. I guarantee you it'll be a wonderful promise. It'll be an excellent promise. Just take it and just say what God is saying there. And it'll be a blessing to people. Don't mess with all that religious, other religious stuff, you know. Oh, brother, it's there that God will break your hand, it says. One fellow was telling me, brother, the problem with you is this. You're always taking these nice verses. And you're preaching that. I said, you have taken all the rest. I'm only taking whatever is left out. <laughs> all, all other verses are already taken. Plenty is preached about it. So let me, call, let me take the ones that you have not taken. Now, I get, I'm, what I'm saying is not an exaggeration. It's the truth. And you, this kind of verse, you'll only see in the walls, in the houses hanging, framed. Or you will see it in the calendars, you know. But you'll never hear it when it came time to preaching. Because our bus stopped only in those other verses. <laughs> we only meditated over there. We just skipped all these things. We just went straight past all of these things. You know, it's amazing. How many, by the time I grew up, I read this Bible so many times. I mean, we read it morning, we read it evening, we memorized it. And I mean, thank God for that habit, you know. We did all of those things. But the problem is we never stopped to concentrate on these things. Nobody ever told me. No, I've never heard a preaching about how that God has for us a wealthy place in mind. Nobody ever told me, where are you? Are you in that wealthy place? Are you satisfied? Are you fulfilled? Have you come to that place? Don't you know that God has a place for you like that? Nobody ever told me that. Everybody ever told me that Canaan land is above in heaven. That when I die, I'll get to Canaan land. <laughs> That's where all the blessings are. Milk and honey is there. And I believed it also. But then I began to read and I found out... Uh, 
that Canaan land is here, it is in Christ Jesus and the redemption and the wonderful blessings that God purchased for me through his shed blood and through his death on the cross of Calvary. Read, uh, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Let me read to you from verse 7. Then we cried out to the Lord God our fathers, of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. This is the people of Israel talking about what happened to them in the land of Egypt when they were slaves. They cried out, it seems, and the Lord heard their voice and looked on their affliction, labor, and oppression. Notice those three words. Affliction, labor, and oppression. Egypt was not a good life for them. When they went in there as 70 people, initially it was good life for them because it was during Joseph's days and Joseph had special favor. But after that, they started oppressing. They started becoming jealous of this people that prospered there. And God was with them. And so because of jealousy, they started putting them down. The slavery and all of these things happened. And, and then they lived in such utter slavery that it's described as the affliction, labor, and oppression. That's, that, those three words characterize their life. So Egypt was not a good place. It was a place of lack and want. It was not a place for fulfillment. It was an unhappy place. They didn't like it there because they were trampled upon uh, uh, there, you know, as dirt. They were treated as slaves. They didn't like it there. They were not happy there. It didn't give them anything, you know. It was only trouble. It was affliction, labor, and oppression. That is what characterized Egypt. So they cried out and God heard them. Listen to this. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. <laughs> God brought them out with great terror, signs and wonders. You know, you've read the story in the, in the book of Exodus, how God brought them out with a mighty hand, performed so many miracles for them to just bring them out of the slavery and the oppression and the labor and the uh, affliction of the Egyptians. And then listen to verse 9. He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, that's God's will. Now, somebody told me the other day, so how can you know God's will, brother? It's so difficult to know God's will. Somebody's told him, it's so difficult to know God's will, you know. So he believes that. It's so difficult to know God's will, brother. You should teach us on how to know God's will. I say, Ben, if you want to know God's will, God is speaking here. Do you take time to listen here? See, if you don't listen to the word, then you won't know God's will. If you'll just listen to the teaching of God's word, you will know God's will, what God wants for you. What are we doing every Sunday? What are we doing Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Tuesday night? We're teaching God's will. This is God speaking. This is not man speaking. We're just simply expounding upon what God has said. What did God really say? What did he really mean? That's what our message is all about. We're not trying to preach some religious sermon of what we believe as a denomination or something like that. No, we're preaching, telling people what God is saying here. I said, if you listen to the word, you'll know, the, you'll know his will. But he believes that God's will is so difficult to understand. So he, you know, I, I told him, listen, you know, if you had a child. Suppose you have a child, you know, your, your parents here, mother, ma, your mothers and fathers and so on, you have children. Do you have a child that goes around saying, I don't know what my father's will is. I don't know if he'll reveal it to me or not. I'm trying so hard to find out what it is. For some reason, he's hiding it from me. I don't think he wants to tell it. I don't think he wants to reveal it. So I'm going to write to so-and-so so that he will ask my father what his will is. Hello. A lot of people are doing that now. They write, you know, some people say, write to me. I will pray to the Father. I will ask the will of God for you in this situation and I will write you back, tell you what the Father says. Now, would you like it if your son went and wrote to somebody that you know and said, please find out from my father what he wants from me. If I was the father, I'd be most in insulted. <laughs> I'd call him and say, why did you write to that guy? You want to know something, you ask me. What is the difficulty for you to understand my will? Huh? No child will say that father is trying to hide the will, father is refusing to disclose the will and so on. No, every father and mother 
they in their conversation in their fellowship together in their togetherness and sharing together they come out with it they tell the sons and daughters this is what i want for you this is what i expect for you this is the thing that i we desire for you this is the best that we we want you to do better than what we have done every father every i mean if you're not thinking like that there's something wrong with you see every parent thinks like that and conveys that to the children i want you to do better than me in education i want you to be better than me in ability i want you to go to the next level that's what we all <laughs> tell our children you see and you mean to tell me that you are so good that you will disclose your will to the uh, to the children and you let them know what you want and you, and so on but the heavenly father doesn't disclose his will see the will of god is something that is not so hard to find out it is easy to find out he is speaking all the time here and the holy spirit is here to reveal what he is saying if you will just listen you will know the will of god the will of god is that you should not be under oppression you should not be under this labor you should not be under affliction you should not live in that slavery and in that bondage you should get out you should come out and you must enter into the land of milk and honey that wealthy place that god has for you that's the will of god my friend i began to understand it once i got to the bible and i started looking at it and i started hearing some preaching along these lines and i began to look at my bible and began to search and find out if this is the right thing you see that's how i came to know it you see egypt was not a place of wealth for them it was a wealthy place in the in, in a worldly way it was a rich country it was a very mo- the most powerful nation in the world at that time but for the, not for the people of israel they were oppressed they were downtrodden there they were slaves there it was not good thing for them and they got used to the people around them and and they got used to the life and they started thinking like that they just became like the heathen not like the people of god these are abraham's children just became like heathen they forgot the promises of god they forgot the covenant they forgot that there was a god who said that nobody can enslave you that if those who curse you i will curse those who bless you i will bless you all these promises were given to their forefather and they are the heirs to those promises but they lived under slavery because they did not know that it applied to them and they did not meditate upon it the reason they did not was they got so mingled up with the rest of egypt and all the practices there and all the people there and the way they lived they got all mixed up with that see we have to be careful we need we are living in a world we got to live in a world we can't go live in heaven right now you see you got to live in a world among worldly people and so on but i'll tell you something you should not become worldly you must always be conscious about where you're from and what you're all about uh, your philosophy is different your thinking is different and everything about you is different psalm 1 says it like this blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of the sinners nor sits in the seats of the seat of the scornful you see the association where you are and how you uh, associate uh, who you associate with and how you get involved uh, uh, with the world is very important you may live in the world but you cannot become worldly you do what the word says you do so he says don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly no don't stand in the path of the sinners don't sit in the seat seat of the scornful get out of that kind of association don't get involved so much into that then it says but his delight is in the law of the lord and his in his law does he meditate day and night see that's the believer he lives in the world but is in god's law he meditates day and night that's the number one priority for him he's like unlike the world then it says he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper he is described like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf don't wither and whatever he does prospers the man is described like a tree planted by the rivers of water let me ask you where is that man now he is in a wealthy place that is planted by the rivers of water you see you can't be in a wealthy place just imbibing the philosophies of the world and living like rest of the world and getting into the world and that's all you know no 
you get to the wealthy place and you live that wealthy life you live in the blessings of god when you delight in the word of the lord day and night you become that person that lives in that wealthy place amen turn to deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 7 for the lord your god is bringing you into a good land a land of brooks of water of fountains and springs that flows out of valleys and hills in those days if you want to describe a rich land a good land you have to describe it like this that it's got brooks got fountains got valleys uh you know and so on and then a land of wheat and barley of vines and fig trees and pomegranates a land of olive oil and honey you want to say it in one word got to say it like this it's a land where everything that you need is there in abundance amen you see the description rivers brooks valleys and and olive oil honey wheat and barley fig trees and pomegranates i mean these are the stuff that were very important to them to the people of that day so everything you need everything that you consider most important it's there in plenty and in abundance that's the land now listen to this the lord your god is bringing you into that land right that's what it says in verse 7 now listen to this further description a land in which verse 9 a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing a land whose stones are iron and of out of whose hills you can dig copper rich natural resources everywhere you go riches there is no lack there is no want look at the way it's described you will eat bread without scarcity in which you lack nothing A lot of people have not come to that place. A lot of place, a lot of people are in a place of lack and want, shortcomings. They 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 just don't cannot envision ever arriving at such a place of eating bread without scarcity and uh, where you lack nothing. See this is again a non-stop bus stop. <laughs> We were always on the express. we never stopped in these verses so we never meditated upon this verse amazing you know every time i come to these kinds of verses to preach nowadays i always think about the old times how come we never stopped there that would have been nice one morning as we read this we said this my god you know land in which you will eat bread without scarcity but the problem is we everybody lived in scarcity in those days and we thought it was spiritual and we preached it was spiritual also so our language itself was like that Now when you talk about meat you know we never talked about meat our language itself became different we never talked about meat is as, as something to eat it is something to just keep on the side and just touch and smell <laughs> I mean that's how bad we were and we never thought anything about it we thought we were so spiritual my god we're living on god's blessings going to heaven heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace but here it was hell on earth you know <laughs> and they put four doses in the front and they said watch it everybody one only you know <laughs> don't you eat all that stuff you know so that's the kind of life most people lived so we felt embarrassed stopping here this was an undesirable bus stop for us so we said read on come on let's keep going because this verse doesn't apply to us yeah. this doesn't speak to us we can't live like this we don't have like this we can't uh, you know think of life like this so let's keep going now a lot of people are still keep going you know they, they, they still keep going and they don't stop here a land in which you eat bread without scarcity i want to stop there if i was reading it now in my house i just stop there i say my house will be a house where we eat bread without scarcity there will be much more than enough in the name of jesus because i don't live in a land of scarcity i i am in christ in that wealthy place that wealthy place the bible talks about is my life in jesus christ jesus didn't die for me on the cross and shed his blood and gave his life for me to remove my curse 
so that I can still live and want and lack. No, he did it for me so that I can be blessed. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. There shall not be any lack or want. I shall eat bread without scarcity. Say that, confess that. Lord, you're more than enough for me. Lord, you're more than enough for me. Let's just raise our hands and say that. Lord, Lord, you're more than enough Take it in. so much you gotta give it. 